Hi guys, it's Matt here. Welcome, and today we have another race and class spotlight. Today we have a class spotlight for majors. So let's get right into majors. So there are seven majors in total. They are one course majors, Ogre Major, two course majors, Crystal Maiden and Park, three course majors, Bin Lina and Razor, four course majors, Bin Keep of the Light, and five course mage, Bin Lich. So knowing there are seven majors, what are the major combinations for us? Each time we have three majors, we get a mage amplification or a debuff on the enemy. What does this do? This increases the damage the enemy taken from magic damage. With its three mages, we actually do 40% more magical damage. With four mages, we do additional 40% magic amplification debuff. But because our daughter works things multiplicitly, they multiply things. And what this actually does is, instead of getting 40% more damage increase with magic, we actually get 56% more damage with magic. So in total, we get 96% increased magic damage on the enemy. So which is greater than 40, we just added. Now, let's look at the races and stages. What do I mean by race and stages? It means how strong this race or this class is in the early rounds, middle rounds, and the late game rounds. For mage class, in the early game, the mages are quite weak, simply because most of the mages are two cost, three cost, and four cost mages, and you tend to not find two star mages that early. So what that means is, mages are quite weak in early game, also they don't have an ideal tank. The ogre is the only tank mage, and the ogre himself cannot tank as a frontline, unless he gets to 3 star, and it's not that easy to get him to 3 star. For the mid games, mages really do come into power the moment we find our 2 star razor, the moment we find our 2 star shuttle thing, or once we find 2 star crystal maiden with something like a conquer or razor on the side. Simply because mages really do excel in terms of magic damage, units like Shadow Thing and units like Disruptor is great, which I'll touch on very soon. For the late game, mages are one of the strongest class out there. Only few can match how strong mages are simply because their ability to activate initiators like Tide Hunter, Medusa, Conquer, and Disruptor with Crystal Maiden Mana Region. Because you get mana faster, you tend to cast your spells faster, you tend to be able to control your enemy, get your first round of spells off before they even know what hit them. And because of this, mages are quite strong in the late game. And if you want to see a tier list of the strongest race and class in the mid game and late game, I have a link attached below for one of my guides. So what are the counters to mages? Well, right off the head, there are a few good counters. One is the knights having super armor. When there are two knights, four knights, and six knights, the super armor gives the knights physical and magical damage reduction. And while the mage only casts once every 10 or 15 seconds for most mages, if the knights happen to be having super armor during the cast, they take almost no damage. The second counters are Nagas. Nagas are quite unique race because their main purpose is to counter mages with the magic resistance debuff cancelled out with the magic resistance buff. So how does the Naga magic resistance buff works? It also works by multiplication. So to simply summarize, two Nagas is actually greater than three mages because having two Nagas and versing three mages, you actually don't lose any magic resistance. You actually gain about 2% magic resistance because it works multiplicitly. It's actually 0 0.7 times 1.4, but I'll leave that to you guys who wants the details, and you can leave it in the comments below. I'll leave the calculation for you guys. Now, it is possible for the mages to have the newest counter, being the hunters. Hunters just recently got a change. The hunters also do true damage, also gain a flat amount of damage. Previously, mages tend to hit the peak before hunters do in the mid game, and this allows mages to really cleave and push us over the hunters in the mid game because hunters are slow to react, they need to attack, and they tend to not do enough focus damage to kill the mages fast. Now, with the hunters' buff, the hunters can be more relevant in the mid game and maybe start to punish mages in the mid game before the mages mature. So, it's really up to who is having the win streak and who is having a better economy. 
We're going to go into possible transitions for majors. They have a variety of transitions for majors. It's one of the biggest class of transition and one of the biggest class for comebacks. They are three assessors. The key assessors being Queen of Pain, Morphling, and Templar Assassin. Queen of Pain, Morphling both deal magical damage. Morphling works well with Razor, activating elemental buff. And also, Templar Assassin works very well with Crystal Maiden. Crystal Maiden's mana regeneration aura will give Templar Assassin enough mana that she can become a crucial tank for the mages. She will distract the enemy backline with her refraction, and she will stay alive for a while while she regenerates mana and casts again with the refraction. Mages really love dragons simply because Puck is a mage, and also Viper does a lot of magical damage. Mages can go into th three or six mages with the Shadowfiend, Disruptor, and Conquer for usually the three mages. They add something that mage does not have. It's more AoE damage because a few of the mages tend to be single target damage or slow enough to cast. This is the Lina, this is the Crystal Maiden which is a support, and also this is the Puck which is usually a slow casting mage. The Conquer provides much needed AoE damage and a human silence when you combine Conquer, Lina, Keep of the Light, and Crystal Maiden. And those human silence are often underestimated by people. But when they do silence the Tide and the Dusa in the front line, oh boy, things go really wild. Now, Mage actually goes really well with Medusa and Tide Hunter. This activates the Naga buff, and this also allows the Tide Hunter and Medusa to activate the spells fast with the Crystal Man in regeneration. Mages can go with Queen of Pain and Shadow Thing for a bit of burst damage. Mages can also go with Beast. Now, have you guys seen a mage with a long druid with a lycan? All of a sudden, they are summoning units so much faster, and mages all of a sudden have a great amount of tanks right in front of them. They do great physical damage, and also the mage have enough time to be casting. So, what are other combinations for mages? For the early game, the transition of mages is actually reversed. We can transition from goblins three goblins into mages. We can transition from orc warriors into mages into orc mages. So those are also some of the possible transitions in a reverse form. So instead of mages going to them, they actually go into mages. What are some of the key transition units for mages? Those include Juggernaut, Timbersaw. Those are the transition from the, from the build into the mages. Shadowfing, Razor, Long Druid, Keep of the Light, Conquer, Templar Assassin, or Tank Assassin, Gyrocopter for his great AoE, Tide, and Dusa. And also we can have Lich and other legendaries, because most legendaries have a great spell to cast. And with Crystal Maiden, you can always be sure that most of your legendaries will get it cast off. Unlike most other builds, when you have a 1-star legendary, they tend to stand there, and they tend to not get enough mana, or they tend to die too fast. Let's look at item priorities for mages. I tend to give defensive items to the Ogre Major in the front line. If I have a Timbers or a Conquer, I'll give those items to them as well. For attack and mana items, I tend to separate it into the early game and the late game. For the early game, I tend to give attack and mana generation items to Razor, Shadowfing, Keep of the Light, and Long Druid. Simply because Razor have a really good attack animation, Shadowfin hits for very hard, and Long Jun and Keep of the Light really wants that mana to be casting spells. For the late game, I tend to give my attack damage item to Gyrocopter, mana regeneration to Lich, Tidehunter, Medusa, and Disruptor. I think we don't have to touch too much on the Tidehunter, Medusa, and Disruptor, but it's a Lich we want to focus on. Lich at one star have a decent CD, but his CD is reduced at 2 star. He also changes his bounces from 6 bounces to 9 bounces. So the Lich in a mage lineup often can cast twice in a fight, and that's incredibly strong. We're going to go into the positional guides, which will be separated into the early game, mid game, and late game positionals for mages. And here is a less common positional guide. <laughs> that's the right. Here, guys, is a less common position for mages. We currently have units that mostly are not mages, but we have three mages to activate the magic debuff that amplifies the magic damage the enemy takes. Our main damage dealer is actually the one star razor, one star queen of pain, and the one star conquer, as you can see. The long does 
incredibly great work, but he does not do enough damage. He tanks first. Why is this a new position? Because this is one of the positions I want to show you guys. We turn, oh, myself personally, I tend to adjust according to the units I have. Knowing a crucial damage dealer for me, over here will be the Queen of Pain, which is top four. What I tend to do with Queen of Pain is I tend to adjust for her. I don't want her to jump in and receive too much damage or dies at one star. I want her to be in the semi front line to be dealing damage to the enemy front line. So this is why we have a side positioning for this particular formation. Usually I tend to run majors in a defensive position, but I want to show you guys the side position as well. I think most of us have seen the defensive position where we stack ourselves in the corner. Works very well. But on the off chance you want a position like this, really allows this Queen of Pain to do great amount of AoEs on most of the enemy units. So as you can see over here, she did one AoE. Maybe there's a chance for her to do another AoE, and it's going to be incredible. And she did do another AoE, but on the downside is we're facing some very strong druids. But what I want to show you guys is the amount of damage she does with this particular side positioning. Over here, 167 DPS. That is a one-star Queen of Pain, by the way. So this is something I want to highlight for the early game, positioning for the majors. You can adjust for your units. And if it's Assassin like Queen of Pain, you definitely want to adjust for her. If I had a Shadow thing, I'll be going to the corners as usual, like over here. Over here, we have a mid-game position for majors. As you can see, we're bored in a corner. But usually what I tend to do is I tend to allow my two-star Conquer or two-star Laundry to tank for me in the front line. Here I'm using my Conquer as a semi-anti-mage, knowing that I have a Conquer and a Crystal Maiden. So there's a chance for Conquer to auto-attack and silence the enemy. Unfortunately, I didn't silence the enemy and the enemy silenced me. But on the plus side is, although the Conquer didn't silence the enemy, his major job is to send the boat out. And being the front line, he can receive enough damage to send his boat out at two star. And having the Crystal Maiden really helps us as well. So the highlight over here is that in the mid game, mages really do excel in the corner position. I think that's one of the favorite positions and that's one of the most common positions for mages. The key over here is to know that the Crystal Maiden, once she's dead, she will no longer provide mana regeneration buff to everyone. That means you actually don't want your Crystal Maiden to be too far in front, but also you don't want her to be in the most protective position, like where the shadow thing is, because then she actually don't serve a purpose. I have her right on the bottom corner so she can protect herself against one assassin, but not two assassins, because only one assassin can hit her at the same time if they're melee units. My Crystal Maiden also have a Mass of Madness, in case you guys are wondering. Over here, we have a particular late game position for the majors. What I like to do is I like to split my majors and my crucial units in two parts. One part being a long druid, he is going to be a crucial tank first. The other part being the keeper of the light and Medusa. So over here, if one side gets silenced or gets stunned, the other side have still have a chance of casting. Over here, we got silenced over here. So Medusa was a little delayed, but the long druid got the bear out. If it's reversed, Dusa will be casting while the Lone Druid is still in the silence trying to get the bear out. Although we did lose this round, I think we have minimized how much we would have lost because we have split up compared to the enemy. And this is a very much highlight. I want to show you guys again in this particular positioning. So what I planned is the initiators are my disruptor and my conquer over here. They are standing next to each other because I was worried they will be sniped off if they split apart. The Razor is standing in a position where he has the most chance of doing it, the most AoE, but not protected by the frontliners, so he's split open. So is the Juggernaut. So I left a spot for him. I don't want him to be stealing manners from my frontliners. The top four frontliners want mana. What do I mean by mana? That means they receive damage, they gain mana. So the mana the other units will steal is the damage as a minute is steal from them. If they receive damage, they cast faster, they gain mana faster. And for that particular reason, I really do favor having the frontliners in the front line only. This is the first bonus tip for mages. For me personally, I know that mages tend to be at three cost, four cost. And because of that, I know there's the highest rate to find three cost units at level six. So I tend to rush myself into level 6, sometimes even level 7 to find a critical, critical purple unit. For me, the critical purple units for mages are also Long Druid, Conquer, Keep of the Light, and Templar Assassin. 
and I have explained a few of those units because Conquer and Long Druid are always critical units for most lineup. For mages especially, the Conquer is a human. Not only does he does great AoE, but being a human, he can silence passively on the enemy with a random chance. I don't count on it, but when it happens like here with the train protector, it's really nice. And later in game, he becomes a passive anti-mage. Here is a second bonus tip. Looking over here, we have a few units. What we do not have is we do not have a lot of mages on the board. What you notice is I have a two-star clockwork, two-star enchantress. But we are also keeping a Beastmaster. So what's happening is the second tip, that we don't try to go into mages right off. Over here, I did go into mages because I didn't have anything better than a Puck and Lena and the Razor. If I had something better, I'll be replacing them for a while before I put the mages on. Why is that? Because mages are weak early game. You tend to not find your two-star mages early, so we want to transition into mages after round 10. You can keep on your mages here, but the key thing is to win or not lose the early game too badly. Because not only you get great economy, great income with winning, you also protect your health. Every bit of health is very crucial for the mages. So I mentioned that it's okay to lose with mages. Over here, we're going to be losing with mages, and we're going to start a losing streak. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the losing streak. You keep losing, and each round you lose, you get a bonus of gold because you have most, uh, you have lost multiple rounds. But with mages, it's especially nice knowing that we can transition into a strong lineup of mages in the mid game. But there is a downside to it. Every bit of HP is quite crucial for the mage once we get into the late game. Why is that? Because we have troubles defeating dragons, troubles defeating chores with our enigma, and lots of trouble defeating a lot of the PvE monsters. And also, a random chance we could lose massively to a particular counter to us, and if we did not have enough health back then, we might just lose outright our chance to be top 1 player. We might end up top 3 or top 4, but not number 1. So I feel a good mage usually try to protect the HP as much as they can in the early game while having a losing streak. So what do I mean by that? How do you protect a losing streak and how do you protect your health at the same time? Well, it's quite difficult, I have to say. So what I tend to do is, again, I tend to try to go into higher levels, into level 6, having the highest rate of finding crucial units, and I tend to rush to level 7 for mage. Over here, you can see I just rushed to level 7. I don't have the greatest lineup, my only tank is a tiny. So what would most of us do is we tend to allow this loose to continue to go. But for me personally, I have some HP indicators for mages. And over here, it's about to reach one of my HP indicators, which I'll discuss very soon. What do I mean by HP indicators? I look over here on my HP, I look at the round. If it's below round 15, it's okay to be at 70%. But 67 is pretty low for me. If it's over round 16 to round 20, it's okay to be at 50%, but below that, that's too low for me as well. So what do I do when my health is too low? It's that I tend to do two things. I tend to get to level 7 if I can, and after that, I'll be rolling with all my savings. But I tend to balance when I decide to roll. Usually I want to roll after round 16, but sometimes I tend to roll earlier when I have enough pairs. Over here, this is what I want to show you guys. We have been losing continuously with a losing streak. And over here, we have lost to 63%. And just suddenly, we won a round against a player. Knowing that we won a round, we lost our losing streak. This is the moment that's telling me, hey, keep in mind, you lost your losing streak, there's no reason for you to keep losing, because you're just sacrificing crucial HP for the late game. So what do I do is, I look whether it's a neutral round. If it's a neutral round, I'm happy to wait. If it's not neutral round, what I'll be doing is I'll be rolling. And here, even before the neutral round, I even rolled once. Because what I wanted was, if I didn't get anything, I can stay on 10 gold. If I got something, I have to find pieces to sell to make it 10 gold. And notice here, I'm still scraping for different units. And I really do favor the Conquer, knowing that it's a human buff. And I also really do favor the Razors and the Shadow Fiends for mages. The highlight is not the wolf round, it's what happens after the wolf round. So we'll skip a little bit. And yes, we did lose to four wolves, by the way. So we did not win against the wolves as mages. We have a bit of trouble against them usually. So this round, notice I have 16 gold to start off with. I did not hesitate. 
I rolled instantly because I know I want to protect health. I want to roll to almost every drop of gold simply because I know I want to hit my pairs. And yes, you might look at this and say, wow, he got really lucky. Look how many pairs he's got. And yes, I did got lots of pairs. And yes, I found some crucial units. Let's see what I was sitting on before I started rolling. So I'm going to pause for you guys over here. So once this round starts, let's have a look. And this is before I started rolling, by the way. And if we... Okay, here we go. So before we started rolling, what we're sitting on is one pair of Puck, one pair of Razor, one pair of Shadowfin, one pair of Ogre, one pair of Lina, one pair of Keep of the Light, and one pair of Crystal Maiden. So basically sitting on like five and six pairs. Why am I sitting on those pairs? Because I have been saving those units from earlier game. And the idea is I am rolling here because, yes, I start the round. So let me show you guys over here. I start the round with 16 gold. Two indicators for me. One is my HP is getting lower. It's reaching while my HP indicators are 50%. The second indicator for me is I just lost my winning streak. Or my losing streak, that is. We don't have winning streaks over here. Losing my losing streak means I no longer enjoy extra gold for losing HP. So that means my resource of HP is more critical to me. I don't want to lose my HP no more. So what I do is, so many pairs, just lost the losing streak, let's use our gold. If I did not lose my losing streak, I'll be waiting for one or two more rounds before I spend my gold to have a bit more savings. And yes, we did get quite lucky by hitting most of our critical pairs like Razors and Shadowfing. And once that happens, we transition into the comfortable mage zone. And let me explain to you guys, what do I mean by the comfortable mage zone? The comfortable mage zone is when you have a crucial or two crucial units to two star. This crucial unit could be a two star Queen of Pain, two star Shadow Fin, two star Razor, two star Keep of the Light, and sometimes even a two star Disruptor or two star Long Druid can do the trick. Once they're in the crucial zone, you can consider start saving, or you can consider to save a little bit, but level up again and put down another two star. That will really help you protect your health. I keep focusing on protecting health simply because we know health is critical for majors of every class, every build in the late game. Now guys, I did mention about HP indicators. I'm going to go through the HP indicators with you guys to give you a better scope of what do I mean by some of the indicators. So over here, we usually look at HP in the early game is whether our HP is greater than 80%. It's, it's greater than 80%. If we're on a losing streak, it's okay. We're okay to keep losing. And once we get into the mid game, what do I mean by the mid game? It's around, around 16 onwards. If our HP is just above 60, or between 60 and 50. If that's the case, two things we want to consider. Do we have a winning or losing streak? If we do not, maybe at this point, we want to be completing some of the crucial mage pairs instead of keep saving into the 50 gold because I feel it's such a trap, such a deadly spot for us to be saving to the 50 gold for a mage when you can hit your critical pairs and stop losing that critical, important, essential HP. I use a lot of words here, but that's to emphasize how important HP is for mages. Once we get the HP below 45% as a mage, two things we want to consider. Can we add another unit to the lineup or can we find a crucial unit to two start that changes our board? What are those crucial units? Can be a long druid? Shadow thing, a razor, a conquer, disruptor, maybe a two star dusa. So, by having those crucial units, like over here, we found that the shadow thing instantly have the unit in mind how I'll be swapping, which is a conquer. By having the shadow thing, I know I will be stronger, so it's less likely for me to lose again. So, each time I feel the power curves for majors as step functions, you take a big step with a power up, you take another big step. For example, over here. I did sell my conquer in favor of the gold. But what I could have done is, if I lose again over on this round, I could be leveling up again, put down my conquer, and use the four humans to very good effectiveness. By having four humans, I can counter almost all the frontliners. Over here, what we're looking at is a split formation. And usually over here, there are two HP indicators we want to look at. The first indicator is whether HP is below 20 or just close to 20%. Because at 20%, it's likely that we lose one round, we die, or we, 
only have one chance left. So we really want to save that last chance to something great. So what I usually do is around 20% HP, I tend to split up. But if it's not 20% HP, what I also like to do is after round 31, I tend to split my formation. So for mages, this is to split your formation so that if one side gets silenced, the other side can still get the cast off. Here I have split my side into the ditch and into the keeper of the light. And yes, I did level up again simply because I lost. For each lost, I tend to react with two ways. One is by changing formation. The second is by leveling up and giving myself another form of power. And let's do a conclusion for our mage highlight. Mages are great for, for a few particular things. They're great for comeback. They're great for all the lineups in the middle games. They're great for changing into different lineups with three mages. Mages are weak in the early game. Mages can be strong in the early game if you transition them correctly. But mages really do excel in the mid game and the late game once you have critical attack units, AoE units like Razor, Shadow Thing, and Disruptor. Mages work well in a lot of lineups. We can try different things with mages, but we need to keep in mind the importance of HP. And once you figure mage out, you will really have a lot of fun watching the enemy get wiped out with one or two single cast. It's really enjoyable. I recommend you guys try it. And this will be end of today's highlight. And thank you so much for you guys watching. If you guys want to support me further, please do share the videos. Please you know, share with your friends and let them know what we do. And we're always here to help. We're always here to provide guide and assistance. So thank you again, guys, for all your support. And I'll see you guys next time.